people, and welcome to episode number 12 of the Technical Explanation Show. Hey, in episode 12, we speak with Jeff Sittler. Jeff is uh, living outside of Dayton. Uh, he's been an official all over the place in the United States, partly because he served in uh, the United States Air Force. So he's a, a United States Air Force uh, veteran. Uh, Jeff, thanks again for your service. Um, near the end, after we hear Jeff's awesome wrestling story, uh, he talks a little bit about the Wrestle Against Autism tournament, um, which is near and dear to his heart. Um, there's, it's near and dear to my heart, too. I didn't know half of what Jeff told me. Um, it's just a really powerful tournament. Not only is it for a good cause, but uh, that weekend, uh, Fred Feeney, who is uh, one of our earlier guests, does his class where he uh, trains uh, new officials and then we get new officials for the upcoming season so um, buckle up uh, this is a great story I hope you enjoyed as much as I uh, enjoy telling it and uh, we'll see you on the other side on episode 13 enjoy episode 12 of technical explanation show I'm here with Jeff Sittler how you doing Jeff pretty good Bryce how are you today well if you're pretty good come on get a little excited here we're gonna talk wrestling here in a second all right and I know we're going to talk about something near and dear to your heart, too. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, where, are you, where are you calling in today from? I'm for, I'm here in uh, Beaver Creek, Ohio. Okay. That's uh, right by Dayton, right? We've talked about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my only my only like point of uh, reference for Beaver Creek, Ohio, is that I remember uh, when my dad coached, he was all like, when you get to the state tournament, I want you don't want you distracted. So we picked the, um, let's say, a hotel that needed some TLC, some tender love and care in Beaver Creek, the Econo Lodge. It had a pool, no water in it. It was just a hole in the ground. Um, we stayed, I think they stayed there for 20 years. One time, they always stayed in the same room. One time someone was in that room and they paid them cash because they were so superstitious just to leave that room so they could sleep in that room for the state tournament. <laughs> so that's beaver creek to me that's my story now let's hear yours uh how did your wrestling story we know you're official but how did your wrestling story start i grew up in northeastern pennsylvania in northeast bradford um, which is northeast bradford county an hour northeast of williamsport an hour north northwest of the scranton wilkes area uh, I could be in New York State in about 25, 30 minutes. So I'm right up there on the border. We talked to Matt. Matt's high school was maybe 40 minutes from my high school. Okay. And that's Matt, um, Matt Sorchinski, right? Sorchinski? Yep, Matt okay. Sorchinski. Yep. Uh, my dad was a wrestling coach. Um, he was the JV coach his first year teaching, became the varsity coach. And pretty much from 1969, through my graduation in 83, I was in a wrestling room in the wintertime. Either he was coaching or um, when he got out of coaching wrestling, I was still in there. I think I was in sixth grade maybe by then. So I'm still in the room in the wintertime, seventh, eighth, and then all through high school. Uh, that was where I was in the wrestling room. I can relate to that, man. Uh, that's that's kind of how my child was too. It just wasn't in Pennsylvania, right? It was in Ohio. Um, what do you remember the most about growing up around the mat or on the mat or at practice around these guys, high schoolers that are older than you? I mean, what, how did you, did you look up to them? Did, were you afraid of them? Did you think they're cool? Um, wrestling is such a family sport. I grew up with a bunch of kids that we all wrestled fourth grade, there was close to a dozen of us, fifth grade, a dozen of us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in ninth grade, there are 12 weight classes. I think we started seven or eight freshmen. We ran the room and what would be normal hazing, for lack of a better term, that would happen to freshmen didn't happen to us. And the, we would get smart with pretty much anybody in the room. And the coach said one day, you know, you guys think you're so smart. What happens if I walk out and turn the lights off? And we responded, your upperclassmen will get their butts kicked. <laughs> yes. And so it, it was a different environment. 
um, very, very rural. I mean, when I say rural, our holiday, we got buck season and doe season off to go hunting. Um, and when I moved out of that area, and I'd say, oh, well, you know, do you get hunting season off? What do you mean you get hunting season off? You get, you get hunting season off. No, that's that's not a thing. I'm like, really? So, um, but I had my dad's best wrestler, according to, you know, my father. He just loved wrestling. And one of his stories was he's the returning regional champ and he is in the first or second round of sectionals and he gets thrown right to his back and my dad's essentially having a heart attack in the corner and Danny winks at him and he rolls over and gets out of it and wins the match handily and he comes off the mat what was that about and Danny goes oh he said his girlfriend's here and he wanted to score some points on me. So I let him throw me. He goes, you what? <laughs> he goes, well, yeah, I figured I'd let him throw me. Don't, don't, don't do that. That's and, awesome. And I had never really heard that. And until much later, I am in college and we're wrestling Widener University. And I have it in my head that I want to throw this kid from Widener. So I try in the first period and I slip. And I'm down two to nothing. And in the second period, I choose neutral. And I slip again, and now I'm down four nothing. And the third period, I, the kid had to choose top. And my coach is having a heart attack in the corner. And I yell out from the center of the mat, relax, it'll be over in 30 seconds. And I reversed him and pinned him and walked off the mat. And my coach is screaming. Still at me. Don't ever do that again. Do what? You're making him look bad. Coach, I'm undefeated. He's winning for nothing. Tell me where he's looking bad. Don't ever do it again. Okay. Yeah. It's stressful being in the chair, man, when you're a coach. Um, so yeah, yeah no it control. was so I I loved scoring points. I just I loved wrestling. I loved dual meets. I was never a fan of tournaments. But I love dual meets and I love scoring points. Um, my favorite was probably when they made the tech ball was still worth six points. So I could run up the store, store and get six points for it. Um, when was that? Was so a, pit, a fall and a tech ball were the same? A fall and a tech ball were the same for the 84 85 season. And I think the 85, there was only one season or two seasons that the tech ball was worth six points. I think I know why I don't know that. You know why? You probably weren't born then. I was two. I was okay. Two. <laughs> Go ahead. So, sorry. yeah, it was the tech ball. I, I was not a fan, but I, I was a fan because I, I was always under the impression if you got pinned, you could convince yourself you got stuck, you got caught. You, you were in the match and you got caught. You get beat 20 to nothing, you, you can't convince yourself that you got caught. Yeah, you, you didn't even belong out, out on the mat at that point, right? I mean, I agree with you, actually. Like, a tech fall, and especially in Northwest, that's where I wrestled and got to watch a lot of, you know, a lot, most of my wrestling. I've, you know, been other places, but that's what it was, right? It's take them down, let them go, because... Oh, that, no, never. I ne That was not me. No. Oh, but I'm saying that's what... But that's what it was in our area because wrestlers these days know that if you put up 15 on someone, that's better than just, you know, wham, bam, you know, feet to back. The, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Conference had 18 or 20, 21 teams. I don't remember who all was in it. There was a, there was a lot of teams. And we're our conference championship. And a kid from King's College walks over and says, hey, congrats, you're in the quarterfinals. And I looked at him, I go, I, there's too many wrestlers. There's no way for me to be in the quarterfinals. I, I can't be in the quarterfinals. Oh, you're wrestling me. Don't hurt me, please. <laughs> that, that was it. 
he had already, he, could, he shook my hand, congratulated me, and walked away. Yeah. Please don't hurt me. That was his request. I, I've heard that at a baby tournament, but not in college. Wow. All right. Well, you know what? I don't know if he was <laughs> to get that far and have that mind. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, that that's that's a. I, that's I a, wrestled him twice already that year. Yeah. Neither, I mean, match, neither, neither match was close. Uh, ran up big points and pinned. Oh, I think one match I pinned him in the first period because we needed the fall. Um, but the other one was, you know, run up the points and do what I do. But he didn't. He wanted no part of. No, he yeah, just, he, didn't, he just yeah. didn't want to be out there. Yeah. And I was okay with he didn't want to be out there. So whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right, right? <laughs> so uh, how did uh, how did you make the transition then to officiating? And like more importantly, why did you want to become an official? Um. I can watch wrestling all the time. I love it. Um, I knew the rules. My, my dad became an official <laughs> when, he, when he quit coaching. There's the dog. Yeah. And so I would get the rule book. The officials got the rule book in October at the first meeting. I got the rule book in August. Hey, hold on. Can I stop you real quick? Just so our listeners at home know, can we know? Can we know the dog's name just so we know who we're hearing? That is Buster. Buster. And what kind of dog is Buster? Buster is a mutt. Uh, supposedly has some shepherd in him, but you've heard the howl. There's definitely yeah. some hound in. Yeah. It starts off with a bark and it fades to a nice to a howl. All right. All right. Uh, he's about so we have that. 80 pounds. So we have that to look forward to then. <laughs> 75, 80 pounds. What color is he? Uh, black. Black with uh, light brown lights. He looks, he's got the shepherd markings. He just, he's got more of a square face. And how old is he? Oh, I picked him up in fall of 2014. Okay. So he's seven. Yeah, cool. That's a good age. All right. Well, all right. So you get the rule book. See, I just go all over the place. I just go where the story That's fine. Comes. Okay. So we know about Buster. If we hear that, if we hear that, we're lucky to hear, right? Because I'm a dog <laughs> person. Um, don't debate. No, anyone listening, let's. If you want to debate about dogs and cats, just give me a call. Um, anyhow, you get the rule book before everyone else because your dad's an official, right? Yep. Okay. And continue. I would study. I would study the change. I knew those rules inside and out. And like I said, I had months to study before the officials ever got it. Wrestling season started in. November. So the officials have essentially a month, five weeks to study the rule book. I've got August, September, October, and November to study the rule book. So I would go over the changes and I would look for stuff that I could use to my advantage. And there were times I would argue my own calls out on the mat. You know, I would tell the coach or tell the official, he can't be doing that. That's in, you know, that's rule such and such. That's this and this. You let me call the mat, match. Well, if you would call it correctly, I would not have to say anything out here. Um, I never got in trouble for that. Um, one of the first, the very first time I ever had to shave was in 10th grade. I had a little peach fuzz right here. And the official goes, you need to shave. And I go, what? He goes, you need to shave. I go, you wait at your meeting on Monday. And I walked away and he turns to my head coach. Who's that? That's the president's son and the rule, one of the rules interpreters for the state. Monday's meeting rolls around. Gentlemen, peach fuzz is not a beer. If it ain't rough, why are you making them shave? And I had him again later in the season. His last name was Sholly. And I said, do I have to shave? He went, nope. I said, okay. And I walked away. Um, so... My mother was livid that an official made me shave when all I had was a little bit of, you know, peach. Fly. If I'd have been a blonde, he'd have never seen. But because I had dark brown, he saw. Um, but I would, I would use those rules. I'd go over those rules. I would argue stuff. I would argue stuff in college. And I'd walk off the mat, and my coach in the Hall of Fame 
in the Pennsylvania wing of the Hall of Fame. He goes, you get away with stuff out there I've never seen. He goes, nobody gets to talk to officials. I go, was I right? He goes, that's not the point. I said, it was to me. He was wrong. And he corrected it. Uh, I'd point out the kids lined up wrong. Yeah, he's not allowed to line up that way. He's got to be He's got to be this, this, and this. Oh, you're absolutely right. Caution. Okay, we're good. Um, so, but I knew those rules. And I used everything I could to my advantage. Um, you know, one of the things about stalling on top, you're behind the hips. Well, Bill Wick, Olympian coach, one of my clinicians at a camp, told me about riding heavy. Well, when you ride heavy, essentially, you've got a thigh on each side of the near thigh. I'm not behind the hips. I'm out to the side. I could still be stalling my butt off. Yeah, it's cowboy right. But I'm out to the side. Right. What do officials look for? Behind the hips. I'm not behind the hips. I'm out to the side. Yeah, nice. I could still, I had a kid from your sinus get, he got stalled out. I wasn't doing anything on top. I mean, I was holding him down, but he couldn't get it. He couldn't move. Stalling, stalling, stalling. And that was in like just the start of the second period. I had enough stalls from the first period. He got DQ'd. And the official afterwards asked me, he goes, was he really stalling or were you holding him down there? Oh, he was really stalling. And I walked away. I'm not going to tell him what I'm doing. Okay, so you got your stripes. Let's start there. What what from there? I mean, how did how did you get to the point where you're so passionate about what we're getting ready to talk to you about here? Today? Um, I I would officiate little kids in Pennsylvania. Um, and ten years in the Air Force, so I moved around a lot. Wherever I would go, I would essentially coach. Um, coached at a club team in Texas. Coached high school in North Carolina. Coached at a club team in California. Got out of the Air Force and um, was going to school at George Mason University. And since I was going to school, uh, I had my nights free. So I took up officiating. So I officiated in, uh, in Northern Virginia. You could officiate in Virginia, Maryland, and DC. So I officiated all three. Um, Interesting wrestling there. Moved out to Indiana and officiated there. More interesting. Uh, some funny stories out there. And then moved to Ohio. And I've been officiating in Ohio since the 2001-2002 season. Um, wrestling, I would say, while I always officiated, in my opinion, like a Pennsylvania official, the wrestling was not all like Pennsylvania wrestling. Yeah, elaborate. Um, um, I'm at a monstrous tournament over in West Lafayette, in Indiana. And I am down counting near fall where four mats come together. And I hit somebody. And I just figure it's a wrestler walking across or it's something along those lines. And I'm counting near fall, and all of a sudden I have somebody right behind me yelling at the wrestlers. And I'm counting near fall, and I look over my shoulder, and it's the coach has come out of his chair, came all the way over to where we were so he could yell at his wrestler on how to adjust on top to try to pin the kid. And the kid didn't do anything wrong. So I'm not going to penalize the kid because his coach isn't where he's supposed to be. But the period ends, and as we're going back to the center, I yell at the coach. I said, you get out of that chair again. I said, I'm taking team points. And it was that match or the next one where we go on break, and I'm in with all the other officials because it's break time, so we're in the hospitality suite, and we're talking, and we're like, and I get well, this is Indiana. Basketball is king here. So we kind of let the coaches do what they want. And I went, uh, no. It's very clear in the rule book what that call is. 
And well, but we kind of let them do what they want. No, we don't. <laughs> I go, that's how problems happen. And if you guys are letting them get away with that kind of stuff, that's on you. They're not doing that on my back, period. Um, so that was that was interesting to for all the other officials to say, well, it's Indiana, basketball's king here. We're going to let them go. Um, and, you know, when I got here to Ohio, here in the Southwest, it's very much a let them up, take them down game. But when I first got here, it was always called the top man for stalling. And if he's, you know, if he's doing what he's supposed to be doing on top, I'm not hitting him for stalling for two reasons. If he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, he's not stalling on top. And I have to stop the match to hit him for stalling on top. Stop on top, right? And Buster. And I use a very much a 4-H approach, head, hands, hips, and heels. If they're not moving, you're sleeping, you're dead, or you're stalling. <laughs> so if he's on the bottom and it's 4-H, he's stalling because something can be moving. There's no reason no matter what the guy on top is doing, that one of those four things is a move. I don't care how tied up you get, you better, something better be moving. And if you're willing to just lay there and let them pound on you, you're stalling. Well, coaches down here in the Southwest didn't care for that. Well, what's he doing on top? I'm, and I'm out there thinking, count on the daylights out of your kid on the bottom is what he's doing. Um, because I, you know, I had that PA mentality and, you know, that's where, that's where that came from is, you know, that was my, my, I think officials officiate like they wrestle because that's what they know. And you get the guys that play, let them up, take them down as officials, they're used to let them up, take them down. So they're not used to a lot of on the mat wrestling. So well, what if that changed though over time? I mean, like out of the start, I could see like, you know, if you've never officiated and you've got your class three or class two, right? But I mean, after doing hundreds of matches in a day and you do that for a season, does does it evolve? I mean, can that leopard change its spots? Um, I think that I think here in the Southwest it has evolved. I see a lot less automatically the top guy is stalling. And it and I would Early on, I would watch matches, and I'm like, the guy's breaking him down. He's coming off to the side. But if they didn't turn him in 15 or 20 seconds, they're hitting the top guy for stalling. Yeah. And I'm like, why are you hitting the top guy for stalling? He's doing – the bottom guy's, you know, resisting. The top guy's job is to try to turn him. They're both working to score points. Why are you automatically hitting the top guy for stalling? Yeah. And um. it took – I think as college has come around some more too, that where that has changed is you mm. see more, you can see more riding and you okay. see less, the top guy is automatically stalling. Um, now there, there've been matches, you know, I'll, I'll be doing a two man at sectionals or districts and I'll be thinking, you know, up, oh, he's going to get ready. He's getting ready to hit green for stalling. And all of a sudden, you know, he'll hit red for stalling. And I'm like, right, what's he seeing that I'm not? But then red's coach is also going absolutely ballistic on why in the world did you just hit our guy for stalling? And, you know, that's a judgment call. It's never a conference of officials. But after the match, I'm like, why did you hit red for stalling? I had green stalling. Why did you hit red? And you know, I might get that. I might get that deer in the headlight looks that I hit the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, I don't know. Why did you hit red for stalling? I said, if you can tell me why you hit red for stalling, then it's not the I wrong guy. Can, you know, agree. But if you're just gonna sit there and go, did I hit the wrong guy? I got nothing for that. Then I'm gonna say yes. So. Um, you know, they get, I don't know if it's caught up in the moment, you know, or, or something along those lines, or just no idea what stalling is. Huh. Um, I want to 
go back really quick because you did you know when you said like they officiate uh how they wrestle right you said that right i didn't put that in your yeah mind. i think i think officials officiate how they wrestle yeah and so after i was thinking about it a little bit more after i, I thought another way to maybe look at it is maybe they officiate because they, that way because that's how they wrestled because they think the other kind of wrestling is boring so if they don't mm -hmm. like wrestling on the mat themselves why yep. would they why would they want to watch someone else wrestle on the mat right so why don't i just bang them on top we'll get back to our feet stop the match and i get to watch what i want i'm not saying that's right but i'm just saying let's uh let's right let's, but if it's top and bottom and they stop it they're still top and bottom because mm -hmm. that's what resets it uh, I think we need to uh, <laughs> uh, deploy the scientific method or something here, but that's a hypothesis at least. Um, so uh, this, uh, man, when we were talking about this before, I'm excited right now. Tell us about what's on your shirt, please. Uh, my shirt says Wrestle Against Autism. In 2006, I believe, Jack Beard brought up at a meeting at Mad River Wrestling Officials Association. He wanted to do something to give back to the community. And we talked about it for a while. And I, and I commented, I said, the only thing we all can do is a wrestling tournament. I said, we have all different backgrounds. The only thing we all have in common is a wrestling tournament. So they said, okay, Jeff, well, research that. We want Ohio State involved. So I said, well, let's do breast cancer and prostate cancer and we'll train change red and green to pink and powder blue i couldn't get people to respond to me on the breast cancer side of things hey, nobody would nobody would email me back let me tell you something though with the with the pink actually just just so you know now because maybe you've been wondering all these years and maybe i'm wrong but um i tried to do something not a wrestling tournament all right uh, i work in finance and for a credit union, we wanted to do a card that, you know, when you do a balance transfer, we'll make 10% of that balance transfer to the credit union, right? When you do that 10% of it, your credit union will give to, to breast cancer, right? And so I went to a hospital and I was like, we want to do this and pink and, and everything else. And I found out that while pink is the ribbon for breast cancer, the Susan G. Komen company or organization or whatever owns that. So like if you use the pink ribbon without their consent, you could get sued. Well, so, they were who I emailed. And it was fine. I know, but yeah, I mean, look how many emails they get, right? Right. Like how much money, right? Because I don't know if you remember, but Honey Nut Cheerios a few years ago, they were doing that and they thought everything was all right on their boxes. And then they got like a, a cease and desist. So but uh, anyhow, go on. I like those. You know what would be cool though? Like, can it is it is it okay to have different ones if it's not like sanctioned? Different color, um, arm wristbands. Yeah, as long as it's not a an FHS NCAA, I would think it's not an issue whatsoever because okay. we're not we're not affiliated with anybody. Okay, oh, yeah. Zach Morris, time out. I don't know if you get that. Someone will. It's from Say by the Bell. Um. Would it be like you couldn't use them, but it'd be kind of cool. I was thinking how cool like gifts to give the officials that are on the show. Like, what if I got like a gray and teal one, like our brand colors, and then just put like guests on it? Like, and you could just you know put it wherever you want, throw it away, whatever. <laughs> Use it to wash wash dishes. I don't care, but it'd be kind of cool. Wouldn't well, it? you could get red and green, and you could get your logo on the wristband. That is yeah. perfectly. Cool. Or what about a disc? You can do the disc too. Yep. Does a disc have to be green and red? Yep, it does. You can't like just okay and eh, whatever all right continue please so i said jack wanted to make said i want ohio state involved so i call tom and i tell him what we want to do and i said he goes into that no we're not into that i said we're so i'm just researching stuff he goes i i in ohio state will help out any way we can i would like to do autism it's the tom same ryan first, that? tom ryan said okay from Ohio first I've ever heard at Ohio State. First I've ever heard the word. The I, Ohio State. Okay. Okay. No knowledge of raw autism whatsoever. So okay. I hang up with Tom and I start researching autism. And in my research, there are a number of wrestlers with autism that 
wrestle and they like the structure, they like the discipline. And the more I read, um, autism affects mostly boys, wrestling is mostly boys. Um, they like the structure. They did not like the chaos of team sports, of basketball, football, hockey, um, too much overstimulation, I guess. A lot of unknowns, lot of too. A lot of unknowns. A lot of unknowns, right? Um, but they liked the discipline and structure. And you could, you know, the coaching, you know, this is how you do it. And they could get that in and they could, they could do that. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, with the structure. Um, the structure is huge, right? Um, I coached like you. Uh, I coached high school for a couple of years when I was at school in college. Kind of like you started officiating. I was officiating then too. Um, but we actually had a, a first year wrestler that was on the spectrum on our team, and he he won two matches at districts. I mean, kid, he'd go out there. He's yeah. I mean, he was a. Uh, there's different levels on the spectrum, right? Um, yep. So he his was pretty subtle. There's certain things, right? But. Uh, and you might not ever know, like I didn't know until someone told me, but he loved it. And so, I, I mean, that's just a testament to kind of the research and stuff he did. And um, yeah, that's cool, man. Keep going. Well, through the year, um, there's a young, young man now. Um, I met him when he was very little. He wrestled in our tournament all the way through little kids through high school. Um, just graduated from... Norwich Academy and is now an officer in the United States Army. That's awesome. Hey, by now, the way, thank you for your service too. I, I didn't want to interrupt earlier, but thank you for what you did. Oh, you're welcome. You do. From the time, and, and his mom credits a lot of it to wrestling. When I remember the meltdowns and everything, his first couple of years, like he lost a match. Um, and now all the way up through, he was at Jay Robinson's camp at Minnesota and somebody made a comment about another wrestler well he looks autistic and the young man said well what does that look like well it looks like him he goes well I'm autistic do I look autistic what do you mean you're autistic they had no idea and there's another the, if you were at our tournament the gentleman that sings our national anthem is blind and has autism, qualified for states last year here in Ohio. Yeah, and won a match. He had Patty Gallagher first round, though, didn't he? Yes, he had Patty in the first round. Um, that, and that guy, goes I to called, the Ohio State yep. University now. I called Tom on that one. I said, no offense, Tom. I said, but I'm going to be rooting for Caden. Yeah, Caden. He goes, I understand. He goes, but he said, I don't know about that one. I said, I don't know about it either, but I'm going to root for Caden. He's in the, they're in the uh, Central District, right? Central District, yes. Olin Berlin Bears, I think, right? Yes, you are correct. Awesome. Yeah, there's a great video uh, about his story, you know, when he qualified uh, for the state tournament and then he won a match. And that was one yep. of the things that I think all of us, as much as I, I really believe we are fortunate to get to have a state tournament last year, it was different. It was in three different locations. And that that was one of the guys that I wanted to see wrestle like, and, and, you know, I didn't get to do that, but we still got a tournament in. Right. So continue. Uh, so he sings the national anthem. Sings the national anthem, plays the piano, plays the trumpet. I want to say plays the guitar, but I'm not positive on that one. Um, and when Darcy or Jamie see this, they'll correct me. So I'm okay there. That's all right. Um, leave a comment below. Leave a comment on YouTube or wherever, whenever we post this. Give us the, the correct information, please. Go ahead. Um, so, started doing all the research. I went back to the board of Mad River Wrestling First Association and said, okay, I think we should do autism. Here's why I think we should do autism, et cetera, et cetera. And the board, I think, voted unanimously yes, that's what we're going to do. Oh, Jeff, you're in charge. So it's funny how that works. You know, I've grown up around tournaments my whole life. So I'm like, okay, it's a wrestling thing. I got this. It's a wrestling thing. And so the whole time, it's a wrestling thing. Wrestling tournaments have to start on time. Wrestling tournaments need officials. Wrestling, you know, I'm going through the whole gamut. We have it. I think we only made like $1,500 the first year. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm like, as long as everything's paid for, then everything else is great. 
So we made money, we made $1,500, we donated it, everything is good. But after the fact, I'm getting a lot of messages. Oh, that is so wonderful. My son's autistic, my daughter's autistic. Thank you so much. I can't believe you guys are having a tournament for this. You know, so in my head, I'm like, huh, I don't know that it's really a wrestling tournament. Yeah, it is a wrestling and autism tournament, but so when we talk, when I talk before the whole event starts on that Sunday, I tell them, remember, it's a tool today. Yes, we're wrestling. Yes, we expect competition. Do not berate my officials. They are volunteers. Do not berate my table help. They are volunteers. You are here out of the goodness of your heart as a charitable event. Remember that. Do not, you know, lose your mind because Jimmy, Johnny, or Jane lost three to two and you didn't like the call. Remember while you're here. And I had an official one year. He came to me. He says, oh, my word, Jeff. He says, I was losing my mind. He goes, the behavior of some of these people, he says, then everything changed. And uh, you know, Dave Reese was the official. His son wrestled at Ohio University. Oh, you? Bobcat? Yep, he was a Bobcat. Austin, that was he. Austin had a medical issue on the mat at Ohio University. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, so Dave comes to me, he goes, then I'm doing this match where I have two wrestlers, and I know I know wrestler A, and he is significantly better than the kid he's wrestling, and he's losing, and he loses the match, and I go, and I raise the other kid's hand, and I hang on to his hand, and the other kid walks away. I go, what are you doing? He goes, oh, he's autistic. I lost on purpose. You what? He goes, I lost on purpose. So. Now the bracket knows what's going on. Well, the, the kid, the wrestler with autism comes all the way back through and finishes third because everybody's throwing their matches. Yeah, the man. kid that beat him apologizes to his mom. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Yeah. Um, Those are the moments, <laughs> man, when you see those stories that just remind you, even though sometimes like, you know, it's a tough time now, right now. That, that reminds you how awesome wrestling is. This, this guy still wrestles. He's now post high school. I have a bracket for him. I recruit, I recruit coaches to wrestle in this bracket for him. Uh, one of the coaches, matter of fact, he wrestled in the Greco, oh, US Nationals, not this last time, the time before. He's a good wrestler. And he got thrown by, he goes, he was a lot stronger than I thought. He goes, I thought, I'm going to get pinned here. I did not, I intend to lose, but I did not intend to get pinned. He goes, I had to fight. He's a lot stronger than I thought. Oh, man. Um, so we had that. I had another wrestler. His dad um, wrestled and he became an official eventually, but his dad wrestled. And he had never seen his dad lose, or never never seen his dad in an altercation. So he threw a major fit on the mat. And he's another one I watched mature through the years with wrestling and autism. <clears throat> but I, he wrestled for Lakota East or Lakota West. Down south, and I'm right? Out there doing Except his Butler, mat. Except Butler County. Uh, yes. Think, yeah. Okay. And he comes out. And he shakes, oh, Mr. Sittler, so nice you're out here officiating my match right in front of the other wrestler. And I'm out there, just drop, I'm thinking, shh, please, no. And he ends up winning the match, and he shakes my hand again. Oh, thanks for officiating my match, Mr. Sittler. That was so wonderful of you. And the kid's still out here. And I walk up, and the match ends, and he was wrestling on 180-something at the time. I had a match or two left. And I go up and talk to his dad. I appreciate his enthusiasm. I know that he knows me. Please ask him not to do that when we're out on the mat. Yeah. I said, he can do that all he wants off of the side. I said, not in the center of the mat. How many tournaments and now? How many tournaments? This will be our 13th here in October. 13th. So um, I, I asked that, though, because you said the first one you cleared $1,500. Yeah. 
Yep. How is it? Now we clear anywhere from 15 to 22,000. That's what I'm talking about, man. That's gross. That's awesome. Um, overall, we've grossed 195,000 tournament wise, but it's really 197 because last year when we didn't have a tournament, we still had, we had a, uh, a gun raffle, a wrestler of Jack's owns a gun shop and gave us 10 guns to raffle off or eight guns to raffle off. I forget, but we made $2,000. Nothing like um, a good gun raffle though. I'll tell you what, you yep. can find some of the nicest firearms at those things. Um, and, and again, wrestling is such a family thing. Um, we have an auction at the event. I have gotten stuff from Matt Hughes, UFC champ, wrestled at the uh, Southern I mean, Illinois Saluki. Yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. He's a Saluki. That's a dog, okay. right? That's a kind of a dog. Yep. I uh, get stuff. I've gotten stuff from Randy Couture. Mm. Everybody knows Randy. Yeah. Uh, I have gotten stuff from Ben Askren. I, I message the guys. I tell them it's a charity tournament. That doesn't they send me something. Me. Any of those guys doing that. That's awesome. Um, and his name just left me. He calls himself the baddest man on the planet. He's a UFC guy, but he did Greco for years. Um, Joe Warren, there it is. Okay. Joe Warren sends me stuff. Um, I would email Rule or uh, Bruce Baumgartner at Edinburgh to send me some auction stuff. Uh, John Smith, o Oklahoma State, has sent me stuff in the past. That's great. Um, like I said, it's such a family event that you know I tell them what it's about. What's going on? Can you send me something to the auction off? The Na National Wrestling Hall of Fame sends me stuff every year at auction off. Uh, Frank Jasper, who played Shoot in Vision Quest, I have stuff autographed from him to auction off. Uh, Frank's a great guy. Um, gonna make the weight. <laughs> You're gonna make the yep. weight, sweet. What's the matter? You can't hold your blood. <laughs> yep. I want just you should auction off some cameos from him. Like, you know, you get a cameo from him and he'll say some line. You know what a cameo is? They make like a personalized video message. You can pay like three hundred dollars to have someone do that. I was gonna auction. Frank agreed the one year, and we didn't get to it. We were gonna auction off getting thrown by Frank Shoot or throwing Frank Shoot if they would pony up like three hundred, and yeah, we would if, film it. If, I think it would be so cool to have both of them do a cameo together, like uh, uh, loud in um uh, Matthew Modine. To, yep. Like, I mean, because come on, that's like for them what yep. it's just time but like yep. to someone like i want that video <laughs> I, I actually have the book vision quest back there did you know it was a book do you know it's do you have it autographed i do not because he had by, I, he have, by I have it autographed he is bipolar because i email the author and tell him what i'm doing and he sends me autographed copies to auction off yeah he he, he so he he has a bipolar disorder he he's, he uh struggles with that so I'm sure that he's behind this thing too, because he understands the stigma surrounding yep. uh, these kind of um, diagnoses. But um, we lost we lost one who was going to come. Carlton Hasserig was, and his wife were all ready to come uh, last year. I got canceled. And then he passed. Um, sent me a bunch of autograph books. They already had a pre-planned something something, and he was all ready to come in and. And he passed away. Obviously, that kind of went away, but he was more than happy to come in. Um, wow. That just, so, I mean, look, you said it's a family, right? And you just gave like 10 examples of how exactly it is a family. These people that know nothing about each other, all they really, the only thing they have in common, like you said, that started this whole thing is wrestling. Like yep. that's, that's like the, the thread that weaves through everyone's story and kind of ties that all together. Um, that's at least that's kind of what I'm gathering. Is that fair to say? I yes, because I I, I posted this I think on the Autism Wall, the Wrestle Against Autism Facebook page. Wrestling is so much different. I can talk to an Olympic or world champ about wrestling, and I can talk to a first year wrestler about wrestling, and the conversation is essentially the same without even a click. But I noticed in team sports, 
I noticed it with my when my daughter played basketball. All the short girls hung together. All the tall girls hung together. In football, the backs hang together, the linemen hang together. The, you know, there's there's an almost an automatic built-in click. And I I never played football. No idea. But it seems like a professional football player really doesn't go out of their way to talk to first-year football player per se, whereas, you know, how, how many times do you see Jordan Burrow bent down on a knee talking to some little kid? Yeah. Well, it's a – yeah, and I don't know what exactly it is, but, I mean, there's definitely that aspect of – like when you meet new people, right? I don't know if like we do this consciously or subconsciously, but like when you meet new people, you automatically try to find what similarity do I have, right? Like yep. you try to relate, whether you know you do or don't. Like, I mean, most people, right? If you try, want to be right. a nice, a, a good human being and look at everyone and say, I'm the same as them, we're both human beings, right? Um, so you try to do that. But when you come to a conversation as a former wrestler, it doesn't matter if you're a junior high conference champ and that was the height of your career or if yep. you're a two-time olympic medalist one of them being a gold like jordan burroughs right doesn't matter you don't have to do that like i need to relate to you because you have the cues right and, yep. and then that's done now it's just let's talk so it's that's just the coolest thing man that's why i think this show in my opinion <laughs> again i'm biased but like it's so easy to talk for 45 minutes with the person i've had couple conversations and some texts and stuff with right but you know we're doing this right now um, yep. it'd be a lot different you know if we weren't didn't have that thing uh, well, that, I, you know, similar there. I'll, I obviously have a lot of wrestling shirts official shirt all that kind of stuff and you too I had a I had a former not my supervisor but another supervisor at work walked in he goes oh you wrestled I went yep he goes I wrestled for a day you guys are nuts <laughs> <laughs> and he goes utmost respect he goes i lasted one day and i was done is that how he delivered it though because that was like perfect delivery like if he did it that yes. way yeah yes that's exactly he goes i did it for a day you guys are nuts uh i want to circle back though to uh the autism uh, you guys are making way you're making 10 times as much money as you made before um where does that go where do the proceeds go um, we run it through the Ethan Foundation for Autism, which is Ethan is Tom's nephew. Ethan is Kim Ryan, Tom's sister's son. So the money gets all funneled into there. From there, she takes stuff to run the foundation, lawyers, accountants, and things that she wants to do. We as a board of wrestling and autism take the majority of the money, even though it's in Ethan Foundation for Autism. If somebody comes and messages us generically, we will not ever give anybody money outright because for the simple fact, let's say we gave, somebody came to us and says, oh, you know, I could really use this for my child. You know, we need $8,000. Well, if I give you eight thousand dollars and all of a sudden you want a big screen TV, I don't have the eight thousand anymore to say no. So everything gets run through something else to make sure it's on the up and up. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wanted a offense because their child was a runner, and by that I mean they would just take off. Mm -hmm. so they wanted a six foot privacy fence because the child's bedroom window opened into the backyard so we made arrangements with Lowe's to have this fence installed and we paid Lowe's directly Lowe's installed the fence um, at a discounted rate because mm -hmm. it was a charitable event um, and we went through Lowe's I forget the name of it I could look it up but Lowe's has a charity thing for doing such things um, most of our money, probably a hundred thousand of our hundred ninety some thousand raised, has gone to Four Paws for Ability. Um, Four Paws trains autism service dogs, and when we started, they were fifteen to seventeen ish thousand. 
they are now 20 to 24,000 ish um, to train because each dog has to be trained to the child. Um, and Why I use is the that? analogy yeah. right. if you and I are blind, the same dog works for both of us. But because every single child is different on the autism spectrum, they have to train the child or train the dog to the child. Um, some children are head beaters. They'll just, they will sit there and they will just beat their head against the wall. Well, they will train the dog to get between the child and the wall and comfort the child. Some are runners. They'll take off. So they are, the dog is trained to track the child. You know, just like you know, a search and rescue just, dog. Oh, very fascinating. I had no um, idea. Um, but yeah, it is specifically trained to the child. And then um, how we get our families is I used to work with a lady named Karen Shirk, who was the founder of Four Paws. Karen has since given it up. I'm assuming nothing is going to change, but Karen has found out that if somebody is given the full amount for their dog, they will not work to keep the training up on the dog because they